Let's do it. And do you mind if we record this for other team members? No, not at all. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you're in. We're in the Zoom one. Mm-hmm. And. I'll just keep the other one open in case we get cut off because uh, I know I've been having zoom issues uh, also take a look at this link in the chat box so in case we if I crash just go see me and uh, let's let's go jump into the other one if you don't mind yeah I should have considered that you guys you know uh, I didn't think of it until this now but obviously the internet is not as as quick and easy to come by in a rural area hmm well, no, we got a fat pipe here of a one gig, so. Um, oh wow! Okay. We're good. All right. <laughs> okay. It's uh, something with my computer. Yep. Um, so yeah, yeah. Let's start uh, regarding so intros. Um, so Andreas is working with us, uh, organizational stuff, and looking into getting into the printers, starting a uh, potentially starting a branch of OSE in in Sweden, where he's from. Um, but maybe you can fill us in on the latest on the, Chica the Illinois PPE network, future plans. Uh, right now we're lowing, lo laying low key. We're we're definitely preparing for some fu future remote events, uh, focusing on making with printers and filament makers. And um, what are your latest in initiatives? Where uh, you're in Chicago Fab Lab. Yeah, so let's well let's do. Uh, I got the agenda pulled up here. Yeah. Um, we can let's do maybe brief intros. You know, I, you know, we had some brief intros on the Fab Academy. I looked at the um, the Open Source Ecology website uh, uh, quite a bit, and actually I started looking at it right before you did your uh, talk uh, for Fab Academy. Uh, Marcin, is that, am I saying your name right? Marcin. Marcin. Okay. Yep. Um, marching. Like marching to the rhythm. <laughs> there you it's, go. It's Thank marching. You. you speak Polish. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, I can talk about what we've been doing with the Fab Lab. I think you're interested in the, it sounds like the PPE. Definitely, uh, like, technology. like as in realistic things that are practical production, you know, to expand right. that. Yeah. That was, uh, Refreshing and also, you know, there's a lot of levels to that that project and what happened. And then uh, I'll talk about the, how the, the network was created and how it runs and what the future plans are for that yep. initiative. Um, I think you, you could meet those guys. Uh, I think that'd be a good idea for March in for you to meet them. Uh, online right now? Uh, um, You're not right now, but in, in the future. From the PPE network or from yeah. the Fab Lab? From the PPE network. Okay. Because I think there's, I feel like there's some parallels between the type of work you do and the, what happened with us here. Like, I think you do this kind of work all the time mm -hmm. um, to a certain extent. It's real practical, what's needed right in the moment, what's, you know, what's made for living and, and having a community. Um, and then I'll talk about there's any kind of collaboration we could have between open source ecology and MSI Fab Lab. And then I'll talk about the Chicago hacker maker and Fab Lab network, uh, mm -hmm. network in yeah. Chicago, because I'm, right. I'm interested in broad, broad, um, connections, which we yeah. initiate initialized years ago at the museum of science and industry. We had this thing called the maker summit. Mm. Um, and ever since we've had that, the museums, sort of considered like the Sweden of organizations in, uh, in Chicago uh, mm. amongst the maker community. The uh, Sweden of organizations, yeah? Yeah, like, I don't know, that's not totally true about Sweden as well. But it's, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a stereotype that Sweden's neutral, right? Um, so we have that uh, neutral stereotype here too. And uh, in Chicago, we're treated as, uh, as an organization that doesn't really have its foot in the state for Chicago Public Schools or Chicago Public Library or other institutions in a way that other ones do. They're strongly connected to the, to the government. Mm. So, And then there's also the uh, Manufacturing Digital Center at Goose Island, which has been ramping up um, and really starting to do effective work on the front of manufacturing technology in the past few years. 
Um, so let's let's start with intro. So I'm I'm Dan Meyer, and let's see here. I got an intro slide that I can share with you that'll make it go quicker. Um, I'll share my screen, and then maybe let's go around and share your guys' background so we know who we're talking to and what our background is. Does yep. that sound good? Yeah, sounds oh, good. There you go. I can see you, Merchant. Great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so let's see here. Uh, share screen. So I'm a manufacturing technologist. Marcin, I think you call yourself a technologist as well, right? But I saw no, no I'm just a farmer scientist. Farmer scientist, OK. Well, manufacturing technologist is a, a very well-known title in the United States. Um, or technologist is used in kind of a kind of a broad, I don't know, kind of strange way, in my opinion. Uh, so I am a combination of basically a technician with a, a associate's degree in manufacturing, and then I have a bachelor's degree in manufacturing technology and management. That makes technically, I guess, a four-year degree makes you a technologist. Sort of a com combination of a scientist and a technician, really, for manufacturing. And all I do is uh, help humans optimize designs for manufacturing. I do a lot of DFM work, design for manufacturing work. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that since 1991. That's almost 30 years now I've been doing this. But I'm, I'm, I know almost every process, manufacturing process, there is out there because of my uh, education at Illinois Institute of Technology. But I um, also had a lot of firsthand experience with it, too. But I'm an expert in die casting and high-speed metal, high metal casting processes is my expertise area. And then foundry, and it extends into normal foundry technology as well, like sand casting and other casting technologies. Uh, die casting um, and high, did you say high speed metal casting? Yeah, any kind of high speed metal casting process. There's some other ones besides just die casting. They're not very well known, but wow. like semi solid casting. What is. Some other stuff like that. What is high speed metal casting? Um, it's when you have, a, in my opinion, it's when you have a quick cycle time. So you, you uh, ah. inject the metal at high speed not slow. You know, it's not like pouring into the sand mold where you have to let it cool for a while and you cool it very fast. So you're talking cycle oh. times of a couple seconds for small parts to maybe at most a minute for very large parts. Like you're talking about something that's like a, an engine die casting, like for a V8 or something like that. So very large die castings can take oh. longer to cool. But compared to sand casting, it's a much faster process. Uh, sand casting, it takes, you know, a very long time for that thing to cool down before you can break it out. And also the process of molding is very slow. The die huh. casting process uses metal dies. It's like in the uh, metal version of a uh, plastic injection molding. How many how many casts does a die last for? That depends on how hot the uh, temperature of the metal is. For stainless so steel casting. Sta oh god, yeah, stainless steel is very, uh, it's mostly non-ferrous metals. So, like, stainless steel is not normally die cast. Oh. Yeah, okay. it's too hot. So, it's uh, aluminum, zinc, magnesium, and then sometimes brass and copper. But brass and copper start to get higher temperatures, so they just destroy the die. So, the die is a consumable item. So, for zinc, it may last a million cycles. So, you can make a million castings or four million castings if you have a four cavity mold. So, that's how many cavities you have. And then you have something like stainless steel can be die cast. You're talking maybe a couple hundred shots. That means cycling the mold open and close, independent of how many cavities it has, or independent of how many parts it makes. And then you have to build a new mold, which is a lot of work. About a hundred cycles. Yeah, for stainless steel. Yeah. And then stainless steel is uh, difficult. You have to do the, the uh, basically the entire injection chamber and machine to be in a vacuum because of oxidization and other stuff like that. It's an interesting question you asked about that because I used to do research. Before mm. I joined the museum, I, I worked for the North American Die Casting Association, and we would do government research on very difficult to cast uh, materials huh. like stainless steel. That's not normal. So mm -hmm. you would it, it's much more economical to produce stainless steel with other casting methods, not die casting. For ingots, so, what would you do first? Stainless steel? Stainless steel ingots? Yeah. Oh, man, I don't even know. You'd have to go... 
you would probably end up using starting with an ingot that's used for sand casting for stainless steel and then you'd modify that alloy to make it uh i'd have to go back and look hmm. at the papers on the die casting yeah. of it well no i'm i'm asking this very specifically because in the global village construction set we we envision um a small scale foundry on a scale of under 10,000 square feet where you're producing about 5,000 to 10,000 pounds of, of virgin steel from scrap using an induction furnace and that would be a feedstock for a completely local metals economy so that's that's what we envision in uh, one of the end states of the global village construction that's in it in a set it's uh, induction furnace and metal rolling or casting however we can get those to those usable ingots or billets uh, that's our deal and then we can we we have the next parts which are about then precision machining that into making your own engines and so forth so so things like hydraulic motors and engines are within the scope of the global village construction set oh uh, okay that makes sense now because yeah. i've looked at a lot of your machines yeah that would i wouldn't i wouldn't liquefy it it's the stainless steel if you're going to do stainless steel i would do it in a semi-solid state I can't remember what the thixotropic properties of stainless steel are, mm. but um, I have a lot of them. <laughs> You're talking to a, I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm eccentric about it or what, but I have some really strong opinions after working in the casting industry mm. for almost my whole career about how stupid the process is. Mm. Like it's, mm. it wastes a lot of energy. People refuse to learn how to uh, process uh, metals in their uh, thixotropic state. If they'd oh. spend some time learning how to process in the thixotropic state, you burn a lot less energy, um, and you sounds... uh, create really sound parts with no porosity. Huh. Like liquefying metal doesn't make any sense to me. To be wow, right? I'd like and, to hear more. That's why that. I want to talk to you because I think mm. a lot of the stuff you're doing is really well thought out, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you are blowing off like the conventional wisdom on it, which is yeah, a yeah. good thing to do. Believe me. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, I, I'm all ears for that. What so this sounds like a high temperature pasta factory instead of li starting yeah. with liquid, right? Yeah. And that's a metaphor also that people can understand. I'm all into that if you can tell me more how that, that would work, but yeah. I'm not attached in any way to liquid. <clears throat> yeah, let's cruise through the rest of my experience. Yeah, and go ahead. About you guys. Um, so this is my team at the Museum of Science and Industry. Because of COVID-19, I lost some members. And that's so, you in the middle? Gerard, yeah, that's me in the middle. Mm -hmm. Got Patrick is my coordinator. He does all the education uh, systems. So our, and I'll talk about our in a moment. Uh, Jen is my facilitator three. She's the highest level facilitator in the museum. Facilitators actually do the work on the floor with guests that visit the museum. And then they help with the educational programs. Then I have currently two facilitator ones, Liz and Kyle. And then I had another coordinator, Gerard, but he got a job just before the pandemic in an IT company that does global networking for parking garages. So actually, it was uh, thank God he got that job because he might have been cut, and that would have really been hard on him. And then uh, Eric got cut. We had over 200 people laid off from the museum because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't I won't get into how I ran that our governor, government and the museum are not having enough money to support people during the pandemic. But anyway, um, and then there's me who's been there. Me and Jen have been there the longest. We've been there for 10 years almost now. Patrick was about a year later, so he's been there for about nine years. So mm -hmm. lucky to have a big team. And there, we have a lot of physicists on our team, uh, a lot of people into science and, and technology, and then some pretty varied backgrounds as well. Um, mm -hmm. Our first thing is Chicago Public High School students in the three mile radius around the museum are on the south side of Chicago. It's mainly African American community that has been uh, ignored by the uh, larger community unit of uh, Chicago. And so we focus purposely on that. The interesting part of that is now the museum's like, how can we do more of this work? And I'm like, we're already doing it. Like our student program is already all black and brown students. It was the first program in the museum's history to have all black and brown students in it. So we were doing that work before. Black and brown? Brown? Yeah, so so it's all like, um, it's all black. For a while it was 100% African American students, but now we have, um, uh, you know, Middle Eastern mm. descent students, things like that. Okay. So it's all minority, what you would say in old days, minorities. 
Uh, uh, in in black and brown, are you considering Asian background? No, uh, we, we, I don't know. I don't know about that. We don't have any Asian students yet. Okay. So it's, there's no white privileged students in our programs because mm -hmm. historically in the museum world mm. and in the museum of science and industry, you start a program and then you have drift and eventually it's all white because all the resource seekers start taking over your program. And the museum hasn't prevented that in the past and we've worked hard. Wow. Uh, resource, what, how does that work? Resource seekers gentrify it? Yep. It's like, it's like, it's a form of gentrification. Exactly. How, how does that work? It's uh, institutionalized racism, in my opinion. So the institution's large and bureaucratic, and you get this drift. It's not purposeful on anyone's part. Uh -huh. They don't. Uh, they don't enforce and market their programs only in the areas that really need it. And in some cases, you need to start a program. In my opinion, that should be high paid a program that's paid and you pay for it. That's for privileged. Uh, students, because you can have black privileged students too, right? From an affluent background. So it's really about that. And huh. you need to make sure you protect your program from students coming from other areas. The way we do that is we only do Chicago public high school students in a three mile radius. Huh. That's how we did it. And when we walked to every school in the three mile radius and talked to the administrators and told them about our program. Hmm. Me and Gerard did that. It took us a whole summer mm -hmm. walking around and then actually being in the neighborhoods and talking to the people and they're like, wow, you're serious. And, we're, and they're like, is this program going to go away? We're like, no, we're going to keep doing it because they were suspicious of us at first because the museum had never really stuck to their guns on uh, to helping the community. And so hmm. it's nice now because the museum's completely dedicated to that because of the protests happening. They're like, holy shit, we need to change. So they're listening finally, right? So the protests are working. Hmm. our institutions in Chicago. It's working for the museum at least. Hmm. Oh wow. And the president said outright, we have institutionalized racism, we've been doing we've been doing these things and we have to change it. And I've heard you guys complaining about it before. I didn't do anything about it, now I'm gonna do it. So he's wow. it. Huh. It's kind of this the hmm. people are waking up. The protests are working. Wow. So Okay, so you can tell I'm getting pretty wound up, but <laughs> it's very important to me. And to be able to do this work after working in industry for so long, is, it's really refreshing to be doing this work. Yeah. So the next one is educators in the Chicago area, because they're the ones that serve the Chicago Public High School students, really. So we do a lot of training. We've trained over 300 teachers on how to run their own fab labs in schools and how to integrate fab lab and making activities, practical making activities into the classroom. We have, for instance, the YMCA uses our training system now. It's about based on crime belts, from white belt to black belt. So let's say, I'm trying to think of something like, you know, what would be white belt? Maybe building a 3D printer would be white belt at the open source psychology. And then when you build a tractor, that's black belt. But that's the kind of scale of machines. You could kind of assign a belt level with moving up the system. Um, and then we have for each technology of a column, like a 3D printer has from white belt to black belt. So it could be mixed a couple of different ways. But anyway, I'm getting a little off topic. Oh, how many educators, what level, what's the level of their implementation of Fab Labs in their schools? Like good, it can, it decent be, ones? It can, uh, it can range from just doing one lesson plan for the grade after training up with us um, on one topic all the way to a uh, full blown Fab Lab or maker space. So it has a wide range of hmm. implementation. I want to have, in the three mile radius, I'd like to have fab labs in all the high schools and then also all the Chicago public libraries. We've trained over 300 Chicago public librarians to run their maker spaces. Hmm. And I forget hmm. how many they have now around the city. Hmm. Let's get them all so, in a big auditorium and build a thousand 3D printers in one day. Yes, that's one of the things I want to talk to you about. That's my. Uh, the long-term arc of my uh, Fab Academy project is exactly that. Oh, great. Um, so I'll cover that briefly, too. Okay, so you can see how my team and I have worked to change the museum's yeah. and its usefulness. So in 2011, when I joined the team, huh. I was hired to fix it. Neil was calling it the first failed Fab Lab because it was still underutilized. Hmm. We had maybe 100 users per year in 2010. Hmm. Um, so I took over and quickly we started ramping up into the thousands. 
These are oh, the wow. number of people that have visited and designed and made something in our fab lab. So in 2019, we surpassed 12,000 people designing and making something in our fab lab. Hmm. So when I you say design, do you use open software? It's not open. We use, uh, uh, that one's a tough one. So I will try to use open source software as much as possible. We use Windows 10 for operating system because that's what everybody knows in Chicago. And then we use free, um, that's a quotations a little bit software whenever possible. So um, it, it's no cost to the person except for sometimes it's their personal information. But our software process flows uh, are designed to minimize the cost to the user and maximize um, the easiness of designing because some of the open source softwares are too hard for people to learn in our hour long workshops in my opinion. Would you be interested in transitioning to open source software if we can teach teach your people in an hour to do design units sufficient for, for 3D printing? I would, but you have to really convince me that that's possible. And I'm not sure if my team's ready for it. So I've been running Linux. I'm running Linux right now at home. I've been running it for over a year exclusively. Mm -hmm. I only go into Windows when I have to present to somebody that's mm -hmm. also using Windows. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe yeah. in that very strongly. I don't think it's, uh, I don't, I, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, it's, it's not worth my time trying to convince the museum to switch. It's, it's too much to go to all uh, open source process well. Mm -hmm. I do as much as possible as I can, and I demonstrate it to students mm -hmm. so that they can make the choice on their own, but it's, it's uh, there's other things that we spend time on besides doing that full open source uh, flow. Mm -hmm. My uh, spouse, uh, Gaddy, is uh, gender neutral. We use they and them pronouns. Um, we're married and live here in Chicago and we do tons of biking. What does um, gen gender neutral mean? Gender neutral means they uh, use they and them pronouns and they the what? consider themselves. They use they and them pronouns. What pronouns? So they and them, theirs. So instead of. They uh, and them? Yeah, so instead of using. your My pronouns are he, him. His, mm. and then I'm guessing your pronouns are the same, right? Mm. He him his is how you like to be referred to. Typically, yeah. Yeah, you don't like to be called she or they. And so Gaddy prefers. Thanks for asking, by the way. Yeah, a sure. lot of people don't ask. Sure. Uh, so pr the preference is they or they or them. Okay, we're switching over. Ah. Hey guys, uh, hey Martian. Yeah. we lost uh, Dan. We okay, can we get Dan back in there? Uh, Fascinating story. Fascinating. Would you try to reconnect or should I send a link to? Send him a link. Uh, I, I did it in the chat box, so he should be getting here because I mentioned join us another. Yeah, this key just keeps happening. Uh, I can't do Zoom right now. For some okay, reason. Okay, so Zoom doesn't tend to work for, for Martian, so if we can change to the conference. Uh, yeah, great. Great. Uh, you got your video, or you're being shy today? Okay, oh. Dan. Uh, yeah, guys, can you turn on your video? And Dan, you might be... It doesn't seem to work for me. Mm -hmm. You have to restart something. Yeah, you can, you can hit yeah, refresh. We'll, we'll it'll, it'll get right back in. Dan, if you're talking, you're talking to yourself as well. Because I cannot hear you. I right. can't hear you still. Uh, you might want to just click on the mute, unmute audio or just refresh. There we go. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, so, yeah, this doesn't crash on me, so you, you still have the chat box in the upper left. If you want to show, you can share your screen if you want to go back to sharing your screen. Yeah, where do we do that from? Is that like little screens it's, here? Oh, yeah, here it is. Is there upper... Oh, I think it is first. Share screen is the... Yeah, he probably... Uh, yeah. Click the red button. 
It's the one <laughs> next over, two, two <laughs> over. Wow, they're doing some amazing work at uh, Chicago Fab Lab, and they're fighting institutionalized racism, which I didn't, I don't know how that mechanism works, where they just drift, they drift to, to like, whoever the funders are, they take care of, like, white people, or just inadvertently, or whatever. Or maybe it's that it comes more and more costs in the program, so it excludes more and more people. Hmm. Back. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, now we can hear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that I gotta close up some windows. I'm torturing my computer here. Yeah. Let me do that. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so be some memory free now. By the way, I've been I've been using Linux Mint and it's freaking awesome. I love it. Oh yeah. Yeah, I've been running Linux in '91 on serve, but I've never really used it daily, and it's really nice. What do you guys run? Ubuntu 16.04, right now okay. still. Since I changed, I'm actually at Windows 10. Uh, I used to use Debian and Mint as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I can continue. Uh, share screen. And Ubuntu is very nice. It's, it's like a small scale, light scale version of Ubuntu. And how is it I'm different from X Ubuntu? Um, it's only the the visual uh, overlay, I think, so the desktop management, mm -hmm. if I remember it correctly. Every so time I try to share, this, this 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 probably is probably better. Sorry. Every yeah. time I try to share, the crashes Chrome. And it I get does. Bumped out. Yeah. yeah. So you use Firefox. Um, okay. How about? Um, let's see. In a now here, let me send you this this link. At Google, you should be able to do this under. Uh, Hangouts, let me send you the link right now. We can just, you just need to just click on a link in the chat box, which is. Okay, I got the chat pulled up and wait for the link. Okay, go over there and see if. Okay. If that works and then, for you. This is cool. Uh, this is a, pro uh, what's the software reason right now? Because I'm very interested in, it's, like, I've been using so many different ones. Yeah, it's WebRTC. Uh, the platform particular one is uh, it's just something we found on the internet someone passed on to us but WebRTC is the common open protocol and there's many clients that use that so yeah cool. it works um, let's try Hangouts this one I know will work yeah all right. On the Google Hangouts, that's that I'm not allowed to join the call. You're not? Oh, yeah. let's see what, what's going on then. I got the same thing, Andres. And then, so then... Okay, so I sent it. Why is this not open? But yeah, I just sent an invite to you guys. Did you get it? In your email, I guess? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, and I'm getting a video call request, but I need to be in Hangouts for it to work. Okay, here we go. Let me grab this. You know what? Let's try. It. Have you tried Meet? Meet works better than Hangouts. No, huh? You yeah, haven't tried that one yet. No. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see if I can get one set up really quick. That'll be that's the smoothest so far I've seen. Uh, it actually works quite well. Let's see here. So. Nice this too. seems to work right now. Was it when you share screen that it started to freeze up, or...? Well, actually, I was having... It's probably more about me not <laughs> following instructions, actually. So, let's see here. Okay, I'll try again on that one. Let me go to Hangouts, and then I'll accept that call. Yeah, just call accept me. it. Well, yeah, you should yeah. have gotten it probably in your email. So just click on that. You're, you're calling me right now again, so I just have to move to Hangouts and Linux. It's taking a little while to load. Come on. Also, I can find it. I didn't see it in the email. Let's see. Come on. Hangouts. It's like having. I might need to check my memory usage here. Oh, boy. I'm the only one there. Do you send it to my um, open OPN or to my open source ecology? Open source ecology. Let's see. Oh. Uh, Opena. Okay, I just sent you another one to Opena. Okay, great. Oh, okay. 
Can you... Okay, can you send me the same link? Yeah. Merchant. Yep. Um, Dan Meyer, MS Chicago. Okay, let's see here. Let me open up Outlook. Outlook? What's that? Yeah, I know. They use yeah, my they they're they're we're finally getting them to switch to Gmail. Oh, here it goes. I got it. And I think I'm going to be in here in a second. And like Gmail's not good either, right? <laughs> they just made the switch to that. Well, but we got to go with Microsoft because it's the greatest supporter of open source projects out there right now. Okay, it's true. There, I'm good. It's true. That I'm not yeah, I, I didn't give a yeah. in terms of my but Microsoft also gives quite a lot. I'm not so sure about the Microsoft thing though, right? It's... No, no, it's uh, Google it. Uh, Microsoft is, funds the most employees out of any yeah. company to do full time Linux development, yeah, open source development. Yeah, but people are afraid that they're just going to kill it after they take it over. I don't think that's true. But... No, no, I think, I, I think that has changed. I think they kind of cleaned up. Yeah, I agree. I think they are. Like PowerShell runs in Linux and in Windows now, which is awesome. Share your screen. Yeah. Okay, okay, share your screen. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay. I have to get oriented to how to share your screen in this software. There we go. Share screen. Yeah, where is that? Okay. Um, no, it's asking what screen I want to do. Share so, screen, yeah, it's in the... Scare screen. No, hamburger. It's in the hamburger. I got the hamburger out. Let's see if this is the right screen. Sure. Okay, now I gotta go back to my intro page because I closed all my tabs. <laughs> uh, what happened to all the analog telephones? Well, clearly, uh, 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 bookmarks bar with all the ones relevant is. Here we go. Okay, so there we go. <laughs> there we go. All right, you see that? Yeah. Okay, let me keep moving. Yeah, we can take it too long here. I'm um, a member at the Southside Hacker Space. Yes. I'm yeah, but I'm seeing myself, there. though. I'm You're seeing yourself? yourself? Yeah. Okay, so let's see here. So switch your window. Yeah, there it is. There now I go. see the... I'm going to expand that. Thank yeah. you. Uh -huh. the, uh, I have three monitors, and uh, Google Hangouts was, like, flickering. I couldn't really tell which one was the right one, so thank you. Okay. Okay, so at the Southside Hacker Space, I do a lot of work. I Hold am on a hacker. Is that, is that separate from the museum? It is separate from the museum. Thanks for asking that. Mm -hmm. So um, I consider myself a hacker first, a technologist second, and then my job third. In that order. Uh, and it, being involved with the hackerspace got me the job at the museum, actually, because they posted on the hackerspace uh, form, message forms. Mm -hmm. So we do fun stuff there, right? The hackerspace is supposed to be about what you want to do as a community, and the community decides that it kind of has this weekly board meeting and that just that determines the direction um, that we take. So we built RC airplanes as one of the projects I ran. Uh, we built six of them at once and then we went out and flew them. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff we do at the hackerspace. Mm. Um, and then I use a lot of the concepts I learned and test at the hackerspace for programming at the museum, which but then it has to be formalized. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been involved with making things uh, professionally since 1991. So as soon as I was legal to work in the hazardous industry, I was working in it. And that's when my sand casting experience started. Actually before that, because we did it in community college. So I've done a lot of heavy uh, manufacturing. First 3D printer I ever used was in the year 2000. It was an FDM 2000. It cost $150,000 for that machine that's shown there. That's you welding was, pipe? Yeah, this is me welding pipe. So I'm a, uh, I can do all the technologies all the way up to really heavy duty TIG. This is a thousand, uh, a thousand amp TIG welder I'm using here, water cooled. Uh, you can see it's pretty heavy mm. work, right? Wow. We're doing very large uh, sand castings. This is my, uh, my uh, great grandfather's uh, Light Tub Brothers foundry. It's a couple miles away from the museum. So when oh, I was wow. going to community college, I would work in the, in the foundry to pay for my tuition, which wow. community college is really cheap. And then this thing back here is a Las Vegas railing. Um, it's like an art, art piece, and it's in a wooden fixture. And then I had to weld that all together. Is the so, foundry still exist? 
Yeah, mm -hmm. my uh, cousins now. It's a patriarch, so it gets passed to the men, and so it's passed to my cousins now. I'm on the my mo I'm on the mom I'm on the woman's side of the family of the lighthouse, so it doesn't get passed to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about. <laughs> Uh, we won't get into the patriarch <laughs> talk, but it's not really fair at all. Okay. So, and then I did a lot of high automation or lots of heavy automation in die casting industry. So basically taking unskilled laborers and training them to be highly skilled technicians that run robotic work cells so that we can produce more castings than China can except with automation so we can keep our jobs. That was the only way we could keep die casting alive in the United States is to fully automate trainer workers. Is that currently the case? Hell yes, yeah. We still have die casting in this country? Oh yeah, lots. Yeah. That's a that's a total misconception that we don't have manufacturing in this country. That's the media tricking us. Um, the reason why manufacturing leaves the United States is because we don't have educated workers and technicians that run the plants, is my strong opinion. And the one of the one uh, hmm. one examples of that of that is is if you get a manufacturing technology certificate from Daly College in Chicago or any of the community colleges, you have a hundred percent job placement. Hmm. One hundred percent. That means they're dying for skilled people to run machines and technology like I used for you know fifteen years. So how come that, people are not getting going into that? I don't know. Because I, we need to show them that. And Fab Labs are a great way to do that. Our, my students are considering jobs in manufacturing again. A welding job. You ever see Mike Rowe's page on welding? He does dirty jobs, Mike Rowe. No. You should watch that show. Um, mm -hmm. And then Mike Rowe, he's a big, uh, he's a comedian. But he's like, where are all the people getting their jobs? Like, there's lots of good jobs, which we call dirty jobs, like welding and stuff. I made more, here, let's go back to this picture. I made more money doing this job right here than I make now. Hmm. That's messed up. Like, 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 what the heck? There's, there's a lot of layers to that. But I was making, I was making over a hundred thousand dollars a year when I was a TIG welder. Wow. Now, some of that had to do with overtime and things like that, right? But there was no one else that could do my job. Hmm. So I got paid a ton of money. Hmm. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't, it isn't all about, I was working for my family because there is that stack up there, but I could have left and probably made more money than I made at the foundry, hmm. actually. So the welding jobs, there's all these baby boomers, they're all retiring and there's a huge vacuum of welding. So one of my, one of my friends at the hackerspace, actually Andrew right here, he teaches welding at the local community college, 100% job placement again. People are just dying for, uh, skilled welders Are and the hackers hacker spaces the reason why he changed his career he was a puppeteer and a animatronics person an artist he switched to being a welding teacher because of the hacker space so the hacker space is doing a better job at redirecting people into the industries where you can make money than our own education system what the hell's wrong and you know that martian you're running the, the thing you're running uh, you have the same belief yeah, I do. Um, and, the, and that's why I'm so excited about talking to you guys. Yeah, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And then computers, um, my TV burned out when I was three years old, and my parents never replaced it. So I've grown up with no TV. Uh, so that really helped me. And then in 1988, 87, they bought me this computer, and that was the end. I was like, instead of addicted to TV, I was addicted to computers. Wow. Well, I used to watch the $6 million man until I was in sixth grade. <laughs> okay um and then, i gave, then I I gave up tv in uh in high school cool yeah they're, they're, the people who give up tv they're they're far and few between but it's it, i'm so glad my parents did that then because of that i rewired a modem that wasn't supposed to work with this computer mm. i had to take all 25 pins and rewire them to a different pin out and then the modem worked. So then I got connected to the ARPANET and the early internet, and mm. that was a whole other world open to me. I, the Fab Lab, I, when I did this and was talking to other people on my computer and found this underground world of BBSs to hook up to bulletin board systems mm -hmm. across the Chicagoland area, it was like a whole other world. It was like the Matrix for me. 
Wow. That was my Matrix moment. I couldn't believe it. Like, there was this whole other world where you could do whatever you wanted. You could download all the software. Wow. You could talk to all these different people. You could get into subcultures without anybody stopping you. Huh. It was really cool. And um, did that and, turn for the worse today? Or is it better today? I think it's better and broader. And along with that comes a lot more bad too, right? It's everything comes with that access, right? There was some pretty creepy. There was creepy stuff back then too. Hell yes, I met some pretty creepy, pretty creepy people, and I was smart enough to stay away from them, right? But for the most part, it was an awesome experience. And then I started connecting with other people in my high school, who we would meet online to the BBSs, and then we'd find out who we were in real life later, and that was really exciting. And then here I am in. Uh, probably around 94, 93. Um, this is in Northern Michigan University. I did some mm -hmm. uh, school out there as well. I'm showing my sister how to use a Mazak milling machine. I'm also a ham radio operator. Um, so that's that's about me. Let's hear about you guys. Stop sharing the screen. Yeah. All right, Marshall, do you want to? Well, for me, I, I um, finished my PhD in infusion and then uh, moved to a farm and my tractor broke I paid to get it repaired then it broke again so I started building tractors um, and machines I found that yeah I mean the story you kind of the, the, what you hear in a TED talk is all real that's the good summary and uh, so moving moved out from the, the college level from getting a PhD I moved out to a raw piece of land in Missouri and started to build everything from scratch having a notion that appropriate technology is missing so I wanted to change the world the first thing is you get a piece of land and start experimenting um, so land was my battle cry then we got the land we got 30 acres here and we start to build so this is one of the structures I'm in that we built but um, the idea there was that I found like as soon as I moved out here that all my theoretical knowledge from school was out the window it does not stand any test of reality just like you know when you write a business plan like as soon as you learn the first thing you have to pivot kind of deal it's mm -hmm. it's the thing that reality is a good teacher and i was completely unprepared for that i noticed that i had one no skill nor equipment to make anything sustainable so i acquired both and i'm working on perfecting that so that anybody can replicate this experience towards creating uh any kind of human enterprise at all cost to fulfill their self-determination so did you say you, you got a PhD in, what was it, I can't remember. In plasma uh, physics, in plasma physics oh, yeah. and fusion science and tokamak energy. And um, so that was, some of the wake up moments I talk about are like going to a professor with equations stretching across the board, only to find out that that was all made up, which made me really disappointed. Yeah. Uh, to which I said, hey, people, there's like real problems we got to work on this. Why, what, what are we doing here? So real alienation through that process. But I ended up finishing and uh, getting very minimal skills. I, I did start some urban gardening when I was still in Madison. That's Madison, Wisconsin. So that was the only hands-on experience. And then starting actually to start starting to build some things like solar dehydrator, bicycle power assist, just trying to get into that. Because I was reading a lot of books and certainly my... Uh, theoretical fusion stuff wasn't doing a job in terms of <laughs> obvious use case for bettering humankind so uh, I just did a lot of studies on my own and getting into that kind of experience to starting actually like I noticed that even in academia we we compete for well even in academia like I wasn't able to, to disclose my information fully to to others so I was like what's what's going on here it's like that's ridiculous um, because I thought I was getting shortchanged on my ability to learn from others. And, and if that happens in a public institution, I thought that must be happening everywhere. So that's where I ran into open source. Someone showed me at Linux on their computer. I was like, what? That's cool. You can actually uh, have options. And you can actually download anything you want and you can modify it. Wow, cool, what an eye opener. And then I thought, well, what would it look like if we designed our whole civilization around the concept of open collaboration? And, and yeah. so in the last last year of the PhD, I started open source ecology, uh, organized that, incorporated that in 2004, and uh, moved on from there. So as soon as I graduated, I got a piece of land and, and started to experiment in Missouri because yeah. I had some friends down here. But beyond that... Yeah, so you, 
you're really dedicated to a long arc too, which you don't see very often. Like everybody's all concerned about short, short-term stuff, but you really got a long plan. Oh yeah. So oh, talking about the plan, so 2028 is the finish date for moving on from the Global Village construction set. So whatever we have by that time, that's it. And then we go into applications because there's plenty of applications. Like right now, we can do plenty of applications, like building things rapidly. Like uh, perhaps the major milestone is module break, module-based design. Uh, swarm builds which we call extreme manufacturing where we can build a tractor or a brick press in a single day with a dozen people yeah. or build a house with 50 people in five days like the one the house i'm in here right now so uh we learned that we learned module based design we learned um how to document things how to break things apart using a modular design process which we think can scale now the latest since i've talked to you last uh, the, the idea of extreme enterprise has been crystallizing. And that is, get together a carefully architected event of 200 to 1,000 people to solve the last frontier that open source hardware has not solved and that software or hardware has not solved, which is rapid development to product. That does not happen. Those are long, drawn-out processes. And in yeah. our work, we found that the thing we're, we're solving for is people to show up we never ever had any event where more than like a couple of dozen people participated remotely or more than 50 people participated in real life. Now, we know by modular breakdown that we can architect collaboration architectures which allow hundreds or thousands of people to collaborate. So our vision is to, to throw a 24 hour event where we take one product, it can be too complex, it could be maybe like a open source 3D printed electric motor or maybe a simple welder, something rather simple, which you can knock off in a day to the point of sale, including distribution and enterprise development. This is gonna be a killer. This is gonna change the world, uh, but we haven't done that experiment yet. We've, we've got experience with um, extreme manufacturing, so the rapid builds, and we, now we wanna extend that to extreme development of enterprise. So we call that extreme enterprise. And right now, I threw some notes on what that would look like. I have like 200 roles breaking out so far. Um, and basically it would mean that we orient people rapidly and it has to be all open source tools. That's why I emphasize that, okay, you gotta have open yeah. source tools, no question about it. Otherwise it's, uh, if you don't have, I call that tool chain degeneracy. If you don't have that, everyone's all over the place, you can't coordinate. So part of the requirement is, tool chain degeneracy where everyone's using the same hardware and the same software and the okay. only way you could do that is through open source so yeah. that's part of the thing there so that's that's where we're at right now we're you know kind of designing more stuff we've got we do have two products that you can click buy on which are the two printers we just uh, which are uh, uh, regular 3d printers one a simple one one a bigger one uh, we just uh, pretty much done with testing the 18 inch insulated heated bed version printer so 18 by 18 inch so this is getting to sizable to print, print some real things and currently working on uh, shredding and filament making at very low cost by using 3d printed gear down so I'm, <laughs> it's pretty cool using rubber belts and combine that with metal plastic composites so basically some parts metal some parts rubber and plastic and um, I've got a drive right now that will cost like 100 200 bucks for um, if you understand the number 75 kilogram meters that's the strength oh, that's of a hydraulic. Cool. That's the strength of a hydraulic me uh, motor for oh wheel drive. Yeah, so we're doing that with 3D prints. <laughs> it's awesome. It's cool. <laughs> so that's yeah, that's your what machines are really impressive. Like you know, and I know how hard it is to build machines because you know, I've been working on my whole life. Yeah. So it's really really cool what you guys have done. I was really excited when I found your website. I'm like, what the hell is this? I'm like, yeah. this is like. This is like, this is Fab Lab Mad Max and it's real. Yeah, that's about right. That's a good assessment. Uh, so, for example. <laughs> I gotta write that down now. Fab Lab Mad, Mad Max. Okay. I love making up names for stuff. You'll find that out as you get to know me because I feel like we're gonna be talking a lot more. Oh, that's so good for the brand identity. We should start a it, podcast together. You know, you know what Gaddy said when when they saw your your setup. Yeah. They're like, "When are we moving to Missouri?" Okay. We need they to were really excited by it. Yeah. No, yeah. it's awesome. 
So, so let's let me just explain a little more on where we're at. So, so let well, let me pause for a moment to make sure you guys have the time to do this. I have uh, I added a half hour buffer to our meeting because I knew it might go long, yeah. and so I have time. But I do have at three o'clock a meeting that I need to go to yeah. to attract money to the museum for our programs. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. So take a look at this link and look at micro track. So okay. I want to point that out because we have two products that we're offering for sale right now, which is the D3D Universal and D3D Pro. Uh, did, did that come through? Yeah, it, it came, came through. through. I'm okay. going to it now. Um, yep, cool. Click on the, the micro track, 17.10. But that's an example of, it's like, we built that. That thing is most amazing, but it's also not a product yet. It, it, the, we, as we know... Or as we're learning, it it's like it's not one, two, or three prototypes. You literally have to do dozens or hundreds to get something to work. So that's at mm -hmm. near near product stage. It's not a product, but it's it's like okay, CNC torch table, open source, and make these crank them out, business and everything like that. So so we're at the state where we can be ready for such enterprise development left and right all over the place. Now we got a lot of substance, but very few product actual product releases so a lot of this stuff revolves around releasing product and today I actually thought okay how about we go on crowd supply uh, to do the high temperature 3d printer that I actually thought of that today so that's an example of how I think it's like okay let's think about ways that we can productize and get people involved because once again we are still solving for people showing up we're a volunteer organization uh, mm -hmm. we are working on a business models where you can uh, replicate this. So the latest on that is setting up OSC chapters. So incorporated OSC chapters in different locations that can replicate at least what we do. We have a revenue model based on workshops, extreme manufacturing. We sell some product, and there's just a tiny bit of uh, nonprofit funding. We don't go after after that. We just have some donations here and there. Uh, but that's we're able to sustain it, bare bones, living in a mud hut for the last decade or almost but very simple uh, voluntary simplicity at this point but um at the same time like we're ready to start growing this thing and and not not creating employees but creating entrepreneurs so we look at a model of franchising or uh, partners or chapters not like more like the mcdonald's franchise where we prepare something that people can replicate as opposed to us employing people because we don't believe in creating more employees we believe in creating makers and yeah and your, your goal is to that you could own something like a farm and then build all your own stuff grow all your own food but with you know instead of like like oh, the yeah. homesteaders homesteaders kind of reject the like technology part you're embracing technology completely right so to f summarize on the goals 2028 i mentioned is the completion at which point we get into very explicitly building out campuses that are education immersion facilities like we have here that can be spread all over the world so i want to do about 10,000 of these i probably won't yeah uh, that's awesome. do a lot do a lot of those but that's where we need the absolute efficient techniques uh, we cannot be sipping champagne through the lips of our leaders <laughs> as in <laughs> communism yeah so we gotta right. have take care of efficient distributed production <laughs> and that's where we're at but definitely there is a very explicit intent to do the OSC campus which is facilities that are like a university which someone can understand uh, and it's a mixture of a fab lab, a productive facility, a working farm, education center, eco park, and all that. Conservation zone too, because we believe in cons uh, preserving nature. That's one of the things we got to rebuild the soils and reforest the earth and all that. Um, we've got experiments on that, like a forest or uh, integrated polyculture plant outs here that we do, uh, developing the integrated polyculture uh, based kind of a perennial system. Uh, so yeah, we're all over the place, and uh, now it's time to uh, uh, productize some things, collaborate. Like one thing that we're really trying to solve for is the collaboration aspect, because I noticed one of the big learnings of recent history is that very few projects that are open source are highly collaborative, and very highly col very few highly collaborative projects are open source. They're, they're completely in con uh, like a lot of them don't come together. So we're really focusing on okay, collaborative and open source, and making explicit mechanisms for such collaboration to be possible. Uh, is our is our goal here? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 
Andreas? Yes. Um, right, so... Yeah, I can do a similar like, version. So I started off with the theoretical physics first when I uh, attended university, but I thought it wouldn't be useful enough. Um, so it changed to human rights, um, which in the end was also too theoretical. Um, so you learn about the rights, but you don't really get an power to implement it. Uh, so then I changed to leadership, or after I got that degree, I, I, I changed to leadership and organizing for sustainability. So like basically how can put resources together to actually have an impact. Um, that's also where I got in contact with Martian and open source ecology. Um, so from a theoretical point of view, what I am or how I look at the world is basically from a topological point of view when it comes to how we connect to each other, how that impacts both resource flows and uh, quality of opportunity, and how you can design a system that better accounts for both maximizing efficiency but as well uh, maximizing quality of opportunity while conserving the ecological diversity. Um, and so one way of looking at that would be through open source circular economies. Uh, which again is how we came back to open source ecology. So right now, me and Martin are figuring out how we can collaborate to make something together, um, so we can kind of synergize each other. Um, the I think the, the small ideological differences is I'm still I've gone between uh, like looking at collaboration, and but also think from an evolutionary point of view that competition serves a certain purpose. Um, so I think it's there for a reason, even when you can be to kind of collaborate. Um, and having worked for IBM for a short while, I noticed how they could impact from market economy, which is that every all type of bullshit needs to be phased out sooner or later. Uh, so the good part with <laughs> the, the good part with market uh, economy is that if you have too much bullshit and if the rest of the corporation isn't good enough, then the ones who, t who takes away the bullshit uh, will be phased out. So either you need to get rid of bullshit within your organization, um, or the organizations will fail away, more or less. Um, yeah, you just described what, what happens at the museum. So it, it, often retains, it often retains the bullshit. And then that causes the kind of issues that I was talking about earlier. Exactly right. Yeah. You know, it like it, it encourages that these yeah, large organizations. We well, just got to phase out March, the bullshit. <laughs> March in agrees. Well said. But I worked at the museum before also, so um, I've seen the similar world that you're being in as well. So yeah, and they don't and have the same pressure. And it's in, I've seen it in very conservative Republican metal casting industry, because that's who runs metal casting industries. Oh. Um, and I've seen it, the same thing, in very liberal de Democrat run museums. Uh -huh. Same bullshits. Uh -huh. so, um, both, so to summarize, both the lip tarts and the rep tarts have issues? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Actually, um, I grew I grew up in this uh, affluent town called Flossmore. It's a village, actually. It's really small. They have good teeth, right? And uh, we have a name for them there. So my so I have to give a little background here. This is a good joke too. It's reminding me. So Greg Hobbes was my professor in community college that taught me machine shop welding, robotics, you know, all the hardcore skills for making, right? And he lived in Flossmore, too. And I used to make fun of him when I found that out. I'm like, why do you live in Flossmore? He's like, stop, stop messing with me. And, and he, he, he would call the people we lived with floss morons. And it's because you would loan them a tool, and it would always come back broken. Because uh, they didn't have any idea how to do anything practical, but they were affluent. And, it, and he's like, you know, he was kind of making fun of the fact that people get educated, like we realize, like you get all this education and then you go and try to do something and you're like, holy shit, I don't know, I can't make anything. I can't, I can't, I can't survive, <laughs> with, you know, and then you have this epiphany and you're like, Jesus, it's important to really know how to make things at a base level. Um, so I want to briefly, let's see here, let's, let's spend a few more minutes. Thank you. Thank you guys for giving background. And can we meet again? Do you guys have time for that or not? Yeah. yeah, of course. Okay, cool.
um, cause I think there's something here. So let me show you my final project. And, um, I'm a little embarrassed because you guys are so like, I think there's something about the rural life that really requires you to build everything from the earth all the way from the ground up to civilization essentially. And, 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 and I'm kind of jealous and of that, but at the same time in the urban environment, you're surrounded by like, I love taking computers out of the garbage, putting a solid state drive in them, and then taking more memory that I've collected over the years out of garbage computers, and then making a computer that works for like $50, because that's all you gotta do is spend some money on a solid state drive. And then you have this Linux box that can is that's really powerful. And so the earth, I guess here in an urban environment is different than in a rural environment. Like you can, you can take things out of the garbage here and resurrect them and make something. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very interested in that way of doing things. Now, in order to peep, in order, we call it scrap labbing, where you go, um, or dumpster diving, right? Is the, the, uh, we changed the scrap lab. So it's a little sexier, but, uh, but there's, there's something there and Patrick and the rest of my team, they all, we all love taking stuff out of the garbage and in an urban environment and making things. So, but in order to pe teach people that and then to connect it with the, the fab lab, uh, um, setup, So, hello? I think it's just Dan who disappeared. Um, or are you back, Dan? Yeah, I'm back. back? Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Welcome back. Oh, sorry. There's some, sorry. There's something up with. Uh, here, let me send you a link. Like you did, Merchant. I'm learning here. <laughs> so, let me send a link, and all you have to do is look at this first image. I have a one sheet. Uh, image that explains my project that I'm going to talk about, uh, which I feel like is a really light version of what you're doing. It's the beginnings for Chicago. So mm -hmm. chat, there we go, boom. So pull that up and it's the fab shop um, thing. And it's very social looking. <laughs> So it's uh, oh nice, shop. nice, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Same, I'm on the same page with you because, uh, of course, like COVID uh, enforces this a little bit more. So we actually got um, I'm actually inspired much more to make that one of the platforms. I'm thinking uh, actually talk to about this. Hey, is that did it disappear? I think it disappeared. Right. Actually, my um. Uh, nice. Uh, wow. Uh, he's talking. Uh, he's talking yeah, about the nice. open source uh, microfactory kind of deal. That's great. Core fab shop machines. Um, so bullshit. It's apparently an academic term as well. So it's not completely. <laughs> my my professor colleague. He did research in bullshit organizational bullshits. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Back. You guys have the link. Hello. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what's happening. I need to restart my computer. It's it's, it's but we'll, I think we'll make it through the next few minutes. Hey, Gaddy. Um. So, I am. Hi, I'm Gaddy. Build. They say, say hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. show, you, show yourself, please. <laughs> <laughs> they want to meet you or say hello. They see you. We're nice. We're nice. They guys. have to. They have to go. <laughs> okay. They uh, have a meeting. Okay. Uh, their medical provider. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. I'm back with you guys um, now. Okay, so the first machine I'm going to build is the CNC foam router. Um, that's my final project for Fab Academy. Uh -huh. The metal casting foundry already exists. It's called uh, Foundry in a Box. It's from the American Foundry Society, and you melt metal in a microwave attracting crucible. It's really cool. You should check it out. Does it work? Right. I mean, you bust, you bust your microwaves right or no no um so you know at subway if you ever go to subway and you notice they use microwaves yeah look look at their microwaves they have a air-cooled transducer that flows a lot of air over the transducer so they can run a hundred percent duty cycle the problem is that the whole household microwaves are not a hundred percent duty cycle they're like 20 percent duty cycle wait a second so you figured out how to do microwave metal casting reliably yeah, and you use a commercial microwave like a mi like they, you'd use in a subway. Uh, so you've got shop. this process way down. You you do that at at the. I, I don't have it down. Uh, some uh, 
a university that does a lot of, uh, I think it's the University of Nebraska, they're the ones who figured it all out over the years. And so this is the American Foundry Society thinks this thing's a joke. And it's not. It's really effective. They use it to demonstrate to school children how a foundry works. And I'm like, this thing is really awesome. Why aren't you sharing this as a concept? And what I want to do is I want to, they won't share. I have to call the guy up at a university. You just told this before, Marchand. He'll talk to me on the phone and tell me all the recipes. And I write them down in my notebook. And then I can make it. But unless I call him and ask him that, it's not available to get the recipes. Yeah. It's ridiculous, right? Yeah. It's like academia. So I want to open source this uh, microwave technology. So how, now, hold on a second. How sure are you that this actually works really well, not bust after a few, few I years? I can send you a link where we're using it. You want to see us melting metal and pouring castings? So I can do that real quick. Yeah? Yeah. You know, we get, it's on my YouTube Because I heard page. about this, and the last last word from a person that I thought knew something about it was that, oh, you just burn out, this doesn't work, because you, you keep burning stuff out. You do have to be careful about burning the top of the microwave. So um, what I do is I open the door to the microwave and blow a fan in there between uh, pores, and then you don't burn the top of the microwave. Okay. Wow. It's that, it's that simple. And, right, uh, and it's for small casting, so this is good for an urban environment. Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. Not gonna be, you're not going to be casting stuff like here in your machines. Your induction melting idea... Or the semi-solid idea, I think, is the way to go. Um, so, you know, induction melting would be much better for larger castings. Right. But, but this is a really good way to get started, and if people get used to it, then they understand the power of making parts for smaller machines, and we can scale it up later. Absolutely. So I'm starting in a 500-square-foot apartment. You could have all this equipment is my idea. Link, please. Um, yeah, here, let me send you my video. Well, this still is very relevant to small parts, like the heat sinks that we want to have that we use mm -hmm. uh, right now we're getting a heat the, our heat sinks milled by a free cad guy from columbia missouri actually that he's making us a hundred little heat sinks um but casting is a relevant way to do it absolutely and then you can take your shredder that we're doing right now and you can melt you can do your cans you grind them up grind your cans up and remelt them right can you do that yeah mm -hmm. so this this furnace can uh the problem becomes that when you start doing higher melting temperature things, like you, you could you can do aluminum in it, yeah. But you're you're gonna really be burning the top of the microwave, so you gotta be really careful about cooling the top of the microwave at that point. You can do zinc and tin really easily. Now there's things like zinc aluminum alloys like yeah. ZH12. Yeah, ZH12 yeah. is really awesome. I don't know why oh, people wow. don't use it more often. Same here. So, That's what I was asking. Why aren't people using that? Yeah, I used to give a seminar on zinc. Uh, die casting and nice. alloys. Okay, I have a whole awesome. Food awesome. Slide. So, found, yeah, I'm your foundry guy. Like, I, right. I, I love foundry stuff, and I've done it for years. And it, and it has to be usable and practical. Nice. Okay, let me, I'm going to send you this link now. And then, uh, why don't you guys just briefly pull that up and watch it? It's it's uh, only 30 seconds long. Yeah, but where's the link? Oh, I have to send. <laughs> Uh, I got it. It's in the I'll send it chat box. Oh, okay. Thank you. Got it. Let me know when you hit play. Groovy music. Yeah. You're in there? Yeah, that's me. Where, where, it? where are you there? Let, let me see that. So it's a really Where are you, like up front there, the first guy? Yeah, I have the horrible goatee. Yeah, I'm right in the oh, beginning. Okay. Yeah. You're a very tall guy? You're a pretty tall guy? Yeah, I'm 6'7", uh, 6'8". Six, six, wow. So this is high school students in our Saturday program. They did flow simulation with Magma Soft software. I got them to donate it. So what are you doing they, there? Zinc alloy? So this is tin, but you could okay. easily do zinc. Yeah. You can easily do Z Z N Al zinc alloy 12? ZH12 would be fine. I haven't done aluminum yet, and I want to do that. I actually got the microwave here at home now, and I'm going to do aluminum soon. Wow. But ZA is higher performance than plain aluminum for, for its strength, right? Yeah, zinc aluminum I really want to do, so I have like, some contacts for that. 
It's like, what's going on? Yeah, that's one thing. I, yeah. There's a lot of little treats. Like once you see, like once you understand, it's like, okay. Wait, 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 wait a second. Why aren't people doing this? Yeah. Right? Now, galvanic, galvanic corrosion and corrosion on zinc aluminum alloys is a serious issue for outdoor use, though. So, you know, that's that's an issue. For outdoor, but yeah. now, now if you if you use it and it starts to deteriorate, but then you can just melt it again in your system. So I think that people would be less concerned. But an indoor, like on a 3D printer, that's completely fine, or? Oh yeah, yeah. It's just the mass then, right? You yeah. have a lot of mass because of the zinc, uh, but. If I, you can do aluminum, so you can take all aluminum parts and melt them up and then put them in the system. Okay. Now, I do think that using something like an induction furnace for aluminum would be a better idea long term. Yeah. So anyway, yep. um, so let's go back to the final project again. Mm -hmm. So And then we don't make round parts right now very well. We have no machines that make round parts well. So I wanna, And then circuit boards and a mill are important. So I want to make a small CNC lathe mill combination. Because these little wheels that you buy for all this open source stuff, they're really expensive because they're custom machined. So we should just machine them ourselves, and also you need to be able to make your own circuit boards. So this will be the first trifecta of machines, and then I have the Linux scrap machine uh, PC as an add-on because you need a design computer for free um, or close to free. And then the 3D printer we're also going to make, and the vinyl cutter. I think you should just buy vinyl cutters nowadays. They're so cheap. Um, you can just buy them all right. So I'm going to start with this, and then I'm going to do mass builds. Um, I'm going to start small for the prototype stage, and then I want to ramp it up to maybe 30, maybe 100 people at once building the foam CNC router. Then we move on to the metal casting foundry, and we all build a whole, get that all set up. That's more of like selecting uh, components and stuff like that mm -hmm. to work together. And then the CNC lathe mill, I want to do another mass build. So I'm thinking the next... You know, this is going to be the next five years or so that it'll take me to get all these done. And, and then I want to build a, a machine building community in Chicago that's like a grassroots group. And then we can start talking about really utilizing Fab Labs in every neighborhood. And then from there, I think it'll be unstoppable. Then we'll start, then we'll oh, like be inspired by work that you do. And we just dovetail onto the larger machines, like earth moving machines, mm -hmm. where we could build our own gardens and stuff like that. So I want to cover this this area between a fab lab and your home lab. And you're covering from building from the ground up in a rural area. So I think there's a there's a connection there. And then you have this whole ecosystem of things that can be built. What's your timeline or plan for, what's your next build? What are you looking at right now on your schedule? So it's going to be the CNC foam router because I have to finish the design for it before I graduate from Fab Academy. So I'd really like that machine to be done in, de in a demo point, a pro I think what you call a prototype. Um, I noticed you classify your stuff. Mm -hmm. It'd be a prototype mode just for myself, and then once I prove the prototype works, some final iteration, and then I want to do my first mass build with six people. Uh, can, you, can you do it within what, like the next month or so? Um, within the next month or so, the prototype will be done. And then can you I'm send thinking, a link to your repo? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I can send you my whole repo, um, which, which is just, just my Fab Academy, Academy work right now. Um, I don't have very much on the final. The final project was Fab Shop, and Neil's like, you got to build one machine, not do all three of them at once. So, <laughs> meaning he thought that was too much. Yes, it is too much. And then COVID came, and I'm like, there's, you know. I've been spending a lot of time doing PPE production, which we didn't even talk about. We'll have to talk have about you that met time. any other applied cool people who um, are building practical machines out of the Fab Lab in your class? Or No, the only mass build I've ever involved with that really worked well was uh, we built a bunch of uh, rep wraps back in 2014. We built 40 of them at once. And then out of those 40, only 15 of them worked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's my only successful build. I, I, I'm an admirer of Nadia Peek's work and the M, the machines that make project, mm -hmm. but I have a, the, re, the, and that's just the reason why I want to do my project. There's a real serious problem with making these machines buildable by normal people. Yeah. Like, and But that's our job. As a manager of a fab lab, we have to take the research from MIT fab lab the CBA, and then make it usable for real people. That's my right. job. And so this is my first chance to prove that I can do that. And I've been waiting for 10 years to do this. And now is the time to start building these machines. I've built enough machines. I built a Ordbot 3D printer, which was designed in one evening in Chicago by Bart Dring. 
that thing's really awesome. Do you know Bart? Yeah, I know Bart really well. Yeah, he's a friend of mine. Yeah, cool. And Edward Ford too, when he was living here in Chicago. So I've, I've been all part of these these groups in Chicago. They've been trying to get to this point where they actually make these machines that get used in the community on a, on a larger scale. And the Ordbot is one of the first ones to do that, and is and is open source laser as well. And I agree with you. My 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 projects and this foam cutter, it's all going to be open source uh, flow. I don't want any closed source stuff involved with it at all. That's that would ruin the project. Can you paste your link for your yeah your project? Yeah, thanks. I'm just gonna since you guys seem really cool, I'm gonna kind of be pretty frank with you. I have ADHD, so sometimes it's hard to keep me on track. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind if you kind of redirect me once in a while. Mm -hmm. So can you sleep? I do. I'm medicated finally. They finally diagnosed me last year. I didn't know until this recently. I've had it my whole life. Yeah, we got to open source the relaxation formula. There's a thing called NewCalm out there, and that's like consciousness hacking stuff. But we got to open source that. Google NewCalm, N-U-C-A-L-M, you guys. Oh, cool. Um, I'm actually getting a sample of that from my uh, my people. Is that, is that the one Tony Rogas? So, no, I don't think so. Because I saw. Or is it? Like you, you, you put um, something for your ears, some soul on your neck, and uh, yeah, yeah. Over your oh yeah, maybe he's on top of it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Um, some electrodes or something. Yeah, and that's called uh, transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulation. It's a thing. It's it's real. Yeah, yeah. I thought about or I I bought things to do similar like transcranial direct current stimulation, depending on where you put it, you can mm. get different effects. You can learn things twice as fast if you put them like one here and one here. Oh, wow. It's even more effective if you use a sinus wave instead of just direct. Holy current. cow, sounds like a case for an open source Arduino signal generator. Yeah, um, you only need like a digital to analog converter basically and then a miniature hmm. Arduino. That's cool, that's cool. So we can definitely get into the medical equipment and consciousness hacking as we go forward. The, there's uh, one of my... Uh, one of my protégés, uh, Christian McNamara, he's been collecting medical equipment. He's been doing a lot of this work on the stuff you're talking about for years. He loves this stuff. He'd be a perfect candidate for making some of these things. I'm going to look that up. I just put it down in my notebook. Oh, uh, is he an open source guy? Oh, yeah. Hell yes, yes. Should I know this guy? Is he a known guy? Or? No, you won't, you won't know him. He's a young guy. Yeah, He's out in California now. I hope he's doing okay. So. He was Yale School of Management, or no? He was he came, he was a teenager that came up through my fab lab. He, he was my intern. Basically, me and him started the fab lab, the Museum of Science and Industry. So I had an intern who was part time, and myself who started the fab lab at the or restarted the fab lab, the Museum of Science and Industry. Um, Is he? You went to Yale, or? No, he went to Did Illinois he Institute of Technology. He got a computer science degree from IIT here in Chicago. Yeah, he won't have anything published. He's uh, oh, okay. he's not he's not a published uh, person, but he's very interested in the um, and has been buying medical equipment and modifying, get it running again. So I think it, this would be a cool thing for him to look into, and I'll look mm -hmm. into it as well. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, regarding the COVID initiative, can you may maybe get onto that? Yeah. So uh, if you you have, you have my repo now, so go to my repo. Um, let's go to projects. It's at the top there. Okay, and then on the left thing, you'll have the last panel where it has the project uh, things, and let's see COVID-19 response. COVID-19 response, yeah. Yeah. So I just started, this is my home lab. It's sort of like a pre-version of the fab shop. Mm. Um, so I have a 3D printer, a milling machine, and, and other equipment in here. Mm. Um, right, it's sitting right behind me in this tiny apartment we're living in. And so then I started researching how could I help make things for the uh, medical workers in hospitals. And one of my friends asked if I could make a papper for them. So I 3D printed some papper parts, pr positive air pressure, yeah, yeah. hood systems. And they started building it, but then their papper came. And then we realized it was really hard. Um, I used to do rapid uh, tooling and manufacturing processes for over 20 years for the U.S. military. Um, 
which is when I realized how horrible war was. Um, and I'm, I'm just short of a pacifist now. I, I hate, I don't know why we spent so much money on it. What, what was that? But, Rapid tool pro prototyping? What? So, so normally, for if you know anything about hard tooling like steel dies for die casting, it can take anywhere from months to a year to make one die. And then you use that die for a long time. Um, the U.S. military was very slow at getting new things manufactured. In Afghanistan, remember when they started welding the plates on military vehicles mm -hmm. to protect themselves from roadside bombs? The soldiers started welding plates on themselves. The U.S. Army was like, holy shit, what's happening? We need to be able to respond faster to our soldiers. So they created this thing called uh, RDCOM, I think it was called at the time. It's called U.S. Army's Futures Command now. But all it's about is rapidly designing things that the soldiers need for the battlefield, getting the tooling made, and then making it and delivering it to the battlefield so they don't get killed. Oh, I was wow. involved with that for 20 years. And we went from taking a month to a year for a tool to be made. The fastest we ever built a tool was in three days. And, th and in three weeks, we had something designed by the U.S. Army at Picatinny Arsenal. I helped design it, and then we had the tooling made simultaneously almost. And then three weeks later, there was parts in the battlefield being used in combat. And so it you, never happened before. Did you do the actual milling of the dies and stuff like that? No, I ran the die casting machines that ran them. So I, did, I was a process engineer. So I helped design the part for the process we were going to use. I programmed the machines in and ran the machines with the operators to run them. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else built the tooling. Then later on, when I got to uh, the North American Die Casting Association, I was the project manager for the die casting wing of this rapid deployment of products design. So the, the Army would design it. I taught courses there on how to design the product so the U.S. Army engineers could design faster. And how, then we okay, what's, your, to what's, the core, the parts. what's the core of rapid design? What's the core of rapid design? Yeah, how do you do it? Understanding your process that's going to make it. It's it's probably ah. so. It's it's to you. It's automatic. It's automatic. Right? It's, it's, that's yes. what I do. The rest of the world doesn't think that way. Yeah. You guys are, are weirdos, right? So that's I know that you already know this. Yeah, yeah. So this was this was teaching something like the wow. U.S. Army and the Department of Defense to huh. do how to do it, which is at the biggest bureaucratic organization probably in the Holy world. Holy cow! If if they can do it and they did do it huh. and it was really expensive, this wasn't cheap, right? The amount of money spent on this was crazy, but now they have over 3,000 people doing this work. Back in hmm. 1991, it was maybe a couple hundred people doing this work. So this is how stuff gets developed now. And, wow. and I realized when COVID came, and I got a few more minutes, when COVID came, I want to use the same process to rapidly respond to what the people need in the community. So I started looking around and found these designs. I started printing. Here's the first few, you know, it shows me of my Ordbot printer there, printing them at home. And then I said, hey, work, can I get the bunch of printers and start printing this in mass? A long story short, I produced over 7,000 pieces of uh, PPE face shield frames in 51 days. I had worked for 51 days nonstop. The machines ran 24-7, and you can look at some of the pictures. I what machines are those? Stack. The Flash Forge finders that cost $300 a piece. Mm -hmm. and so I made this crazy one that curls in because they're small machines, mm -hmm. and then you heat them up in the oven, and they pop back out. And then I ship them that way to the south side of Chicago because nobody was giving the south side of Chicago hospitals any protective gear. They were completely being left out like they always are, like black communities are always ignored. And so I delivered to my friend Jackie, and then she'd finish them. She had volunteers, and then they'd give them to hospital workers in the south side of Chicago. This was face masks and respirators? This was uh, face shields only. I started zeroing in on one product because... Those are ones that we could make, and the people seem to be getting the N95s at a decent rate. And the face shield protected the N95 in a medical environment. You needed both to go together, and they were having trouble getting face shields. Hmm. Now, yeah, later on, we, we focus on masks, and the Illinois PPE network is still focusing on masks. Those are much harder to build and much more complex because you get got sewing processes and stuff like that. What about so. 3D printed with rubber gaskets? I tried that, and uh, the rubber gasket process is so slow on the 3D printer. And then later on, other makers realize you should mold them. That's the right way to go is to mold them. It's a much faster process. Um, I used all PLA, and then I printed the machine. I made a custom profile that printed them as fast as possible. So I tuned all the machines like I did as a process engineer. And with, I think it was 14 printers, 
I made those 7,000 pieces wow. of PP in nice. 51 days. And, and then, then I then I burned out and I had to stop. And then I distributed the machines to the south side of Chicago. Now the community is running them how they see fit. Yeah, they're doing it still? They're printing other things. It's, it ends up that they didn't really want to print face shields. They want to print other things and like do what? other things with them. They're doing uh, student camps with them, robotics parts, education type stuff. Mm -hmm. And then uh, six of the printers, I've been teaching courses for people recently released from prison. Um, and they're learning how to do 3D design and print on the printers and they're really excited about it. So we're training the next generation of people getting out of prison to how to have a, you know, I hope that some of them go into manufacturing. Through the Chicago um, Museum or through... So, so I did this all space. without permission. I took the machines out and yeah. I forced them, the museum to realize they should be doing this. And then I gave the machines to these this uh, Lifehouse uh, group that's working with prisoners or former prisoners. And I said, I did this. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. They just had to agree to it because it's too, it's too good. So I, I went out on a limb and I'm like, I'm just freaking doing this. Like we got to stop. We got to start serving the community we're working. We're supposed to be in. The museum is on the south side of Chicago. Stop having, like they don't help the community. And they say over and over again that they will. This all happened before they admitted to it. So then mm -hmm. they recently, because of the protest, admitted to this. And now yeah. I'm like, all right, you guys yeah. got it. One Let's thing go. that switching to the other topic of rapid design. So I mentioned extreme enterprise. Maybe the these army thugs, <laughs> three thousand of rapid manufacturing training people, uh, perfect audience for the rapid design and enterprise events. You think we can connect to them? Would Let me send you a video where I'm interviewed and I talk about what we should do with those guys. Huh. Like we should repurpose those guys. They're highly skilled and they care very much about soldiers' lives. They could very easily be used in a much better way, and a lot of them would like to do that work. Oh yeah, you know, wow, this and that's is a longer-term discussion, and that's you know, that's you know, maybe in my lifetime that will happen. <laughs> but um, I think there's there's something happening in our society now, and I'm really, really uh, so. It's called. Let's see here, and then I got to take off. It's, yep. uh, so Dale Doherty of uh, Make Magazine mm -hmm. uh, interviewed me. It's called Binge Making with Dan Meyer. And I talk about my history in detail with the uh, U.S. military and the reasons why I did what I did. So it's part four of a series, and he interviews all the people in our Illinois PP network. You probably want to listen to all the interviews and read this article because it has a lot of tie-ins with what you guys are doing. So I'll send you this article here, and I'm going to hop off. Mm -hmm. And um, you can read this article. Did you get it? Let's see here. And then watch the videos especially. Make zoom. And you, you'll see, you know, African American community leaders. Jackie Moore's interviewed. Sasha Neary, who's uh, a Latinx woman in Chicago. It, there's me, a privileged white guy, making stuff and sending it to the South Side. You have Jeff Sullen, who works in a Chicago public school. Like this was a huge moment. What happened? And then on top of it, the protests saying, "We gotta help people around us." This is a one-two bam hit in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Great. What's our next step in this relationship? Why don't you guys send me a time you guys want to meet? I'm off all next week, so I'm completely open. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to meet with you guys then. I'm on furlough where I don't get paid, mm -hmm. so I can't do any work with the museum at all. So I'd love to talk to you guys mm -hmm. next week, anytime. Okay. Whatever works best for you guys. Excellent. No, this is really productive. Thank you for talking. Yes, thank you. You get you guys are doing awesome work and really busting your butts and doing the hard work of making the actual stuff. It's really impressive. Yeah. Let's do <laughs> let's do the open source uh, fab lab thing. Uh, what you're there. Yeah, let's definitely collaborate on that. We'll see what we can do. Uh, quickly, I talked to this group called Just One Giant Lab from Paris. Yeah, they're uh -huh. pretty good. They're they've got a platform for open collaboration. This is uh, I talked to the founder uh, leader there, and. We talked about putting ourselves on there and potentially getting their sponsorship or help on um, on an ambitious collaborative project. Maybe like I, I do want to do the open source fab lab. We're just it's time. It's like the fab lab people are ready. Uh, we've got some machines. Uh, it's out there. We got to integrate it. Open source micro factory deal. Yep. Okay. Totally so, agree. Yeah, we'll do it. Uh, we'll talk soon then. Yeah. Yeah. See you, Marchens. See you, Andreas. Bye bye. Take care. See you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Take care. Um, yep. Yeah, I also gotta go have a baby shift. Okay, man. Take care. <laughs> right. We'll see you soon. Take care. This was great. See you. Bye.
Yeah, it was great. Uh, a lot of synergies, I think. Yeah, yeah, really good. Potential synergies. Really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, take care. Bye.